anybody survive the storm last night? Yeah. I have to tell you, I got up this morning, this past weekend, I did a lot of trimming in my house, and I live between Manatee Avenue and Riverview, and uh, if you're familiar with that area near downtown, the, the streets slope down, and I live close to Manatee Avenue, so I'm kind of like at the top of, you want to call it a hill, but anyway, I have this mound of debris of branches I've cut and palm limbs and stuff like that in front of my house. This morning I got up and it's gone. And I looked down the street and it's all in the front of my neighbor's house, all down the street. And I don't know nothing, okay? So I'm just going, I'll see my neighbor out. He said, man, take some, take some respect, man. Clean up your yard, man. Come on, what's up with you guys? But anyway, it was just kind of interesting, man. I mean, seriously, the, this mound of debris, I have no debris in my yard. It's all in my neighbor's yard. So anyway, anyway you guys ready for a joke? Yeah. All right, there's husband and wife. We're driving through New Hampshire, and they're getting ready to drive through a town uh, called Lake Winnebasaki. And he started to argue about how to pronounce that name, and they're arguing back and forth, and they decide to stop in this little town to have lunch, and at the counter, the husband asked the, the blonde waitress, before we order, could you please settle an argument for us? Would you please pronounce where we are at very slowly? And she leaned into him and said, Burger King. <laughs> anyway, all right. Hey, well, we are in week two of our brand new series, This Was Your Idea, and this series is really based on a survey that we took at Easter time, and we asked you guys at Easter time, what are some of the topics that you'd like us to deal with? And so we've been doing this for about three years now. So really, uh, the next few weeks, we're dealing with topics that you guys actually submitted. Last week, we talked about how we can bring about change in our life. And if you happen to miss last week, I want to encourage you, go to our website, and you can listen or watch uh, last week's uh, message. But let's just bow our heads and pray right now. Father, we ask you, God, that you would just help us to glean from, from your word, God, that we would uh, be changed by your word. I just pray, Father, that you, by your Holy Spirit, you would bring it to lie alive in our hearts and our minds and our soul today. And Father, we just pray these things in the name of Jesus. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to be talking about the subject of heaven uh, this morning. And heaven is a question that we all wrestle with, whether we want to admit it or not. Why? Because God has placed that question really within our hearts and, and, and soul. Actually, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says he has also set eternity into the human heart. So even if you're not a Christian, even those people that, that may not believe in God, they will not be able to get away from the fact that at some point they're going to ponder the afterlife. And you're all, and you're all, all of us are always going to have that question. That's why a lot of us will attend a funeral. Maybe we'll go through a, a very um, scary, difficult time in our life and we'll begin to reflect on you know, what, what is life all about if, there, if there's an afterlife? And uh, some of the common questions people will have, will my, will my pets be in heaven? I'll say this, dogs yes, cats no. Okay? <laughs> now, before you uh, cat lovers start sending me hateful emails and texts, I'm only kidding. Actually, when I was growing up, my parents, notice I said my parents had this little Pekingese dog. And I'm telling you, that thing was demon-possessed. I didn't know whether... To, when I petted it, was it going to bite me or lick me? And I just avoided it. I know that dog is not going to be in heaven. But anyway, the Bible actually tells us there's going to be animals in heaven. And so there's a possibility that your, your pet may be in heaven. The animals in heaven will be very tame. The Bible talks about the lion and a, and a lamb actually laying side by side. Another question will, people will have, well, will we be married in heaven? Well, the Bible says no. I want to read what Jesus said. It said, <clears throat> said Jesus replied, The people of the, this age marry and are given in marriage, but those who are considered worthy of taking part in the age to come and in the resurrection from the dead will neither marry nor be given in marriage. Now, some of you all of a sudden become very sad thinking about you're not going to be married. Others you are saying, yes, I can't wait to heaven. Now, if that's your response... I just want to encourage you, our next series is all about relationships, so kind of hang in there. We're going to be dealing with how to have a better marriage. So is heaven going to be boring? In most people's minds, they formed an opinion 
that heaven is not really something I'm looking forward to. And a lot of times we get our ideas from Hollywood, from TV, and many times they give a, a warped perspective of heaven. And even churches can give a wrong idea of heaven. Bill Hybels, he's a great pastor and he, he's a great author of many great books. He talks about his early childhood memories, actually being a child in a children's choir and, and how they always made him dress in a, in a white robe. And for practice, they would literally be standing on these choir risers in his mind, seemed like for hours. And so, and he said to make it worse, the, uh, the choir director actually said this, if you don't like singing in the choir, you're not going to enjoy heaven. So Bill Hybel said this, as a child, I thought of heaven as putting on a choir robe and standing on a riser and singing for all eternity. So I wasn't really all that excited about going to heaven. Now maybe you have some of those, those feelings or maybe you, you just have mixed feelings and, and thoughts about heaven and what to expect. So what's heaven really going to be like? Well, first off, I want to encourage you, we're not going to be floating around on a, uh, on a cloud playing a harp and, and everything's going to be white. But what is it actually going to be like? Well, 1 Thessalonians says this, and now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know, and here's the cool thing, the Bible wants us to know what heaven is going to be like. And the devil has a lot of fake news out there about heaven. But get this, when we really begin to understand what's waiting for us, at the end of this life, when we pass into the next life, I want to tell you, that will cause us to live our lives differently. It will actually help us uh, to really redefine those bad days that all of us are going to ha have when we really understand what's waiting for us. And we'll talk a little more about that in a minute. But the scripture goes on to say, what will happen to the believers who have died so you will not grieve like people who have no hope? And so... Because we're Christians, because we know what, what is coming, we don't have to grieve when, when uh, people are uh, uh, pass on. When I say we don't grieve, we don't grieve without having hope for them if they love Jesus. And I've used that passage many times. And, you know, we can even now think of maybe somebody that has passed on that you're very close to. But again, we don't have to grieve as a person without hope. Why? Because we know what God has in store for us. And scripture goes on to say, For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns. And I just want to stop here and just say this. Jesus is coming back. And that's one of the uh, central doctrines of the Christian, Christian faith. And I believe with all my heart that we're the first generation that can, can look at the signs in the Bible and really draw a conclusion that all those signs leading up to the return of Christ have been fulfilled. So Jesus actually can come back at any point. And we should really do as Scripture tells us, instructs us to, we should anxiously be anticipating his return. And <clears throat> so what's that going to look like? Well, Jesus is going to gather our family members, those loved ones, those friends that, that, that died, that knew him, he's going to gather them, and we're going to have a great reunion. Because it says this, God will bring back with him the believers who have died. So when Jesus comes back, he's bringing our family members, our friends with him. And I love this, that God is such a relational God, that our first experience crossing over to, into this next life, we're going to have a great reunion with our family members. That's a beautiful thought when you really think about it. And said, we tell you this directly from the Lord, we who are still living when the Lord returns will not meet him <clears throat> ahead of those who have died. So Jesus is going to grab our loved ones and he's going to get them first. And the scripture says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, first the Christians who have died will rise from their graves. You may say, well, hey, I thought they were already um, in heaven. What do you mean by this? Actually, there's going to be a reunion when uh, Jesus is going to come back with the soul and the, the bodies that's going to be being raised from the dead. Uh, the, that's their new body those that have passed on. So I don't know about you, but I'm excited about getting a new body. I want to keep my pretty face. Okay, I'm only kidding about the pretty face. But hey, I do want a new body, and we have something great to look forward to. And it says, then together with them, 
we who are still alive and remain on earth will be caught up in the clouds. Meaning we're going to have, again, this grand reunion with our loved ones. And it says, to meet the Lord in the air, then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. And I want to encourage you today that heaven is an incredible place that we can look forward to. And I, I really believe with all my heart, if we really understood what heaven is going to be like, we would desire to be there at this very moment. Now, probably one of the things that, that maybe you don't know is the Bible actually describes two different places. There's actually this intermediate place, and the Bible calls that paradise, and it's not the same heaven where we're actually going to spend eternity. There's this intermediate place called paradise where, again, those people that, that we love, that, that love God, that's where they're at right now. And actually, Jesus and Paul both use this word paradise, and where Jesus used it is when he was on the cross. And if you remember, the one thief repented. And here's what he said. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. And Jesus used that word paradise. And the best word to describe that, that paradise is like a park. It's like a picnic. It's like someplace you would take your family on the weekend after a long week of work, man, just where you can unwind with a family, rest, and, and just be refreshed, maybe toss the football around or, or maybe do a little fishing. It's just more like a park, more like a resort. And a lot of people think, you know, we're going to be like uh, again, going to heaven and having all these mansions and, and things like that. And here's the interesting thing that, that I learned that I did not know uh, before, but as I was uh, preparing for this message, that, that the word mansion is only used, translated one time in a particular translation. That's the King James Version. It's found in John 14, 2. It says this, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go prepare a place for you. And in, that, in the Greek, that word mansion literally translates into temporary lodging. So it's kind of like, again, a, a place that you're just going to be there temporary, a hotel, a resort, a place to get rested, a place to get refreshed. So again, that's where people are at right now. They're in paradise. So that, so that actually leads into the next Next uh, question, well, what about new the new heaven? And that's where we're going to spend the majority of our, of our um, uh, eternity. And again, heaven talks a lot about this, particularly in Revelation. Revelation 21.1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth has passed away. So John had this vision of heaven, but it's coupled with the new earth, which really tells us that, that the new heaven is going to be a part of the new earth. And actually, the new heaven is also called the new Jerusalem. We don't exactly know where it's going to be uh, um, geographically, you know, where, where it's going to actually be. My, my um, guess would be it would be where Jerusalem is today. But it's going to be on absolutely a perfect, perfect earth. And um, we're not going to be floating around. Uh, again, uh, I want to say we're not going to be floating around on clouds. We're going to be living on absolutely the perfect earth. We're going to be able to enjoy everything about earth that we enjoy right now. The, the beaches, the mountains, the beautiful desert, everything that we like in, in, in the, on this planet. We're going to be able to actually experience that on a new earth, but it's going to be perfected. And we're going to, again, just be able to enjoy all of earth in an absolute perfect setting. We'll be able to see Jesus. We'll be able to go. Jesus, is, he's going to be reigning in the New Jerusalem. We're going to be able to go to New Jerusalem, see Jesus. We're going to be able to go to the mountains, go to the ocean. Again, I'm just trying to paint a picture. It's not going to be boring. We're not floating around on, on um, clouds. So what does the Bible say about heaven? Well, here's the first one. is Heaven is a real place. It's not a state of mind. It's a physical place. Actually, you read in Revelations where an angel actually measured it, and it's measured like 1,500 square miles each direction, including up. And so it's actually a place. The Bible talks about how it's going to have streets of gold, and it's going to be such pure, there's going to be such purity in that gold is going to be transparent. You're going to talk about the, the, the gate leading in 
to heaven is going to be made out of a, a single pearl. And again, can you just imagine earth in its purest form, having a new Jerusalem where Jesus is going to reign and there's just going to be a perfect environment for us, which really leads to the second um, observation. That is, it is a perfect place, meaning everything is going to be made right, no pollution, no traffic jam, no sickness, no terrorism, okay, no crime. The Cleveland Indians might actually win a World Series in, in heaven. Hey, sweet berries is going to be there on every corner. Cookies and ice cream is going to be good to eat there. You know, it's not going to have any, it's going to be like vegetables here. You need to eat ice cream and cookies to, to maintain your health. I'm only kidding. I know that's a stretch. But it's going to be no more death, no more cancer. And in Revelation 21, 4 says, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of thing has passed away. I don't know about you, but I've heard people over the years say, you know what, I don't want to go to heaven, man. I want to go to, you know, I'm going to go hang out in hell with my friends. We're going to have a party. I don't know anybody going to heaven, man. We're just going to have a party in hell. Has anybody ever heard that, man? They're scared that, no, you know, heaven's going to be dull. I want to tell you, that's the old order. The old order is death, destruction, terrorism, cancer, pain. God has a new order, a perfect place with no pain. No more crime, right relationship with God in a perfect setting, going back to the Garden of Eden. The number three, heaven is a place of reunion. All of those people that you love, that we know that, <clears throat> that love God, they're going to be a part of, of heaven. We're going to have a great reunion with them. Who else is going to be in heaven? Obviously, God the Father, the, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. The angels are going to be there. The church is going to be there. A common question is, what about babies? I want to say this. All the babies will be in heaven. Every miscarriage, every stillbirth, every abortion, every single one of them will be in heaven. Why? Because we are not responsible for, for what we cannot understand. And God gave us a beautiful picture of this in the Old Testament. With King David in the Old Testament, he had lost a baby that had died at birth. And David said this in 2 Samuel. Now that the baby is dead, I can't bring him back to life. But someday, I will be able to go to be with him. So the first thing that's going to happen in heaven is we're going to have this great reunion. Heaven is a, just a great place for us to enjoy relationships. And you may, again, ask that question, well, why is there no marriage in heaven? It doesn't specifically say why, and I'm certainly not going to pretend like I know the, all the answers. But here's what I do know. I know that God absolutely has our best interest at mind. And I trust in that. The Bible says that heaven is going to be actually beyond our comprehension. It's beyond our imagination. So we can't even really grasp everything that heaven's going to be. But I would encourage you to choose to look at it this way. It's going to be something more, not something less when it comes to relationships. And I don't fully understand what that looks like, but I trust God because he knows what's best for you and I. It's a relational place, again, where we're going to enjoy our friends and family that have gone on before us. Uh, but you know, more important, it's going to be a, a great place for us to interact with God. God's going to want to come to your house, going to hang out with you. The Bible says that we are going to be his people and he is going to be our God. And yes, nations will still exist. God loves the different ethnic groups that he's created on earth. And he created every one of the ethnic groups for his pleasure. I know mankind, they have a hard time, you know, getting a, along with each other when it comes to ethnic groups. But here's what the Bible says in Revelation 22, 2. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And that word nations literally means ethnic groups. And know this. God is not going to make us all look alike in heaven. He's not going to make... Uh, Ethiopians look like Chinese or vice versa. And if you have the attitude, man, if that group of people is going to be in heaven, man, I don't want to be there. Well, I want to say this. If you have that type of attitude, you won't be there anyway. You follow what I'm saying? 
We need to get over that. There is no room in the body of Christ for prejudice or racism. And we're going to be talking about that more in a few weeks. But here's the fourth thing. There will be rewards given out. And, and I hope I can motivate you here because I, my heart's desire, man, <clears throat> what I want to see happen in my life, bottom line, I want to be able to stand before God and God said, well done, Stan. Well done, good and faithful servant. That's my heart's cry. That's what I live for. And I want to do whatever pleases God. But hear, hear this. The Bible says that God's looking to reward you and I. And Jesus says this in Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I am coming soon. My reward is with me. And I will give to everyone according to what he has done. You know what the scriptures tell me? Jesus is bringing, bringing the rewards. He's so excited about bringing us rewards. He's saying, man, I'm going to bring it with me. You follow what I'm saying? And that reward in the Greek literally means repayment for. You may be thinking, God, what are you repaying me for, man? You did it. You did it all. But I want to encourage you that God sees you when you text your friend or you call, pick up the phone and say, hey, man, I know you're going through a difficult time. I just want to tell you, I love you. God loves you. Man, I'm praying for you. I've got your back. I want to tell you, God's sitting up taking notice on that. And this has nothing to do with our salvation. We can't earn our way into heaven. You can't get into heaven by good works. You get into heaven by placing your faith and trust in what Jesus Christ accomplished on Calvary. But the Bible says, though, we will be rewarded according to our good works. And I want to read a couple passages to you. The Bible says this, if you even give a cup of cold water to one of the least of my followers, you will surely be rewarded. I think about those that are working in our, in, in our uh, children's ministry as we speak. Man, they're changing diapers and, and, and they're giving cups of water, they're giving graham crackers, they're wiping runny noses. You know what? God's saying, man, I'm taking notice of that. I'm take, you're going to be rewarded one day for that. I got you. You know what? In this life, maybe nobody else will see us and see what you're doing. But I want to tell you, God sees it. And he's taking note of it. He's going to reward you. The Bible also says, love your enemies. Do good to them. Lend to them. And don't be concerned that they might not repay. Then your reward in heaven will be very great. And here's the thing. You've got to decide. You want your rewards on this side of life or on the next side? And let me be very clear, your whole life is not about this life. And, you know, we live in a great area up until the last couple of days. We have great weather, but seriously, we live in a great area. We, you know, beautiful beaches, and just, it's just a great place to live. It's kind of like a little slice of heaven. But really what happens is many times these good things in this life can be a distraction. And Jesus says this in Matthew 16, 27, For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. And I want to just, <clears throat> we need to be reminded of that from time to time, and that, that's really my job to do that. So what do we do? I want to challenge you this morning. We simply need to live our lives with the eternity in mind. We need to live our lives with the eternity in mind. So that means when you have a bad day, you need to remind yourself you're going to heaven. When you have a good day, you leverage that good day for, the, for eternity. It would be ridiculous to, to make life all about these 70 or 80 years that we're going to live on this planet. We will miss it if we're only focusing in on these 70 and 80 years and missing the bigger picture. And so what do we do? Well, the Bible tells us this in, in Titus, for the grace of God has been revealed. That's Jesus. And it says, bringing salvation to all people, and we are instructed to turn from godless living and sinful pleasure. And this is how we're to live our life. And, and the word here, um, sinful, doesn't really, it's not really referring to doing something evil or, or, or something wrong. The word literally means, you know what, it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a bad thing. It's just we've missed the mark. We're pointed in the right direction. Maybe we're doing good things, but it's not the right thing. Do you follow what I'm saying? It means being distracted. And, and it says this, we should live in this evil world with wisdom, righteousness, and devotion to God while we look forward 
with hope to that wonderful day when the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be revealed. Well, how do we do that? I want to give you three things, three quick things here. First one is this, focus on the big picture. Refocus your life. You need to look at not so much where you're at right now, but where you're going to in the future. I mean, you've got to keep your eyes on a prize. And I want to encourage you just to wear this life loosely, man. Enjoy this life. Make the most of it. But don't get attached to it. And I just, I just want to say we're just passing through this life. And actually, Paul tells us this in Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're just passing through this life. And, and so, so what does that look like? We need, that means, you know what? Again, we need to leverage our life. That means, man, I'm going to use everything that God has entrusted me, my house, my energy, my gifts, my resources. I want to leverage them for eternity. So that means, you know what? When I go to a Bucks game or I go to a Rays game, I'm, I want to invite somebody that maybe needs a, a word of encouragement. Maybe I have a friend that's far from God that maybe I could bring him along and maybe that'd be an opportunity to invite him to church or, or talk to him about spiritual matters. But I'm trying to leverage every part of my life for the kingdom of God. And if we're not careful, again, we could distract it and we begin to fall in love with earth. And a lot of Christians, man, they can fall in love with earth. Why? Why does that happen? Because this is where their treasure is. And Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, that's where you're going, your heart's going to be also. Matthew 6 says this, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasure in heaven. And he's saying, you know what? I don't mind you having treasures. Just don't store them up. Don't let your stuff own you. And that's why we encourage people here at COTC to serve. That's why we encourage people to take the grow track, understand what it means to be a part of the body of Christ, understand how God has wired you so that you can use your gift in ministry. And I would encourage you, don't just attend, attend a service, attend one service and serve in another one. And it's brought to my attention a couple needs, and I just want to lay them out before you, and maybe this is the area that you could help out in. But uh, we've been invited back to Moody Elementary School to do a after-school program on Monday afternoon after school. And actually, they invite us to do a Bible program. What a beautiful thing, a public school inviting us onto their property to, to do a Bible study. And we have people that will do the teaching and everything. We just need a couple more people just to come alongside, help with the refreshments, and help with crowd control. If you can help out, check out uh, the children's table in the foyer. Another uh, need that's been brought to my attention this past week, uh, we want to start a first service junior high Sunday school. We have a second service one going on, being led by Eli Lofton, doing a great job. We want to do that first service. And it's turnkey. We have everything you need to, to, uh, to be able to function there. Maybe God's putting that on your heart to step up. That's you. Go to the youth ministry table. And this is a great opportunity to affect the next generation's eternity. So I want to encourage you to pray about that. There's all kinds of tables out there that you can serve from, from helping out in the office to building the ground, all kinds of stuff, food pantry. Find a place. Why? Why are we pushing you and encouraging you to do that? To make your life count for eternity. So that you can stand at the end of your life before God and God says, you know what? You didn't waste your life. I see how you, you minister to those kids at Bayshore. I see how you minister to those kids at Moody. I see how you helped out that hungry person down the street. We want to be Jesus to our community. Amen? Now, there's some of you here today that maybe you're discouraged. And a thing about life is life will bite you. Can you all agree with that? Life will bite you. It's hurtful. And, and if, you, if you're going through a difficult time and you're thinking, man, is this as good as it gets? And that's your conclusion. I want to tell you, it will be depressing. It will be a, a hard life. And, but if your conclusion is, okay, you know what? I've, I've come to a point in this life, there's going to be painful moments. This life is going to bite. But you know what? The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. That's going to give me a little oomph to be able to push past 
whatever difficulty I'm facing. Paul, the Apostle Paul said, you know what? Man, I'm pressed on every side, but I'm not letting him bother me. I'm persecuted, but you know what? I'm not letting him bother me. He actually says this in 2 Corinthians 4, 18. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. Since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. So what do we need to do? Again, I want to challenge us. We need to refocus. We need to refocus on eternity, not so much on where we're at today, but where we're going in the future. And maybe there's somebody here today that you've lost a loved one and you're grieving. Or maybe you're here today, and, and I'm not trying to be morbid, but maybe you have a bad doctor's report and you're staring death in the face. Or maybe there's somebody close to you. Well, that's, that me this message is for you. Be encouraged. Don't think about where you're at now. Think about where you're going in the future. And I know that has certainly been a big benefit in my life and my wife's life. And maybe it's not an illness that you may be facing, but I've learned to do this. Man, there's times when we have a difficult day waiting for us. You had that meeting maybe with a family member. You're going to have to confront something, and, and you don't know. This could blow up in your face, and you wake up in the morning, and you're dreading that. Anybody been there? You're just dreading. You haven't had that difficult conversation with somebody at work or, or whatever. And you wake up with this cloud over your head. I want to tell you, in mornings like that, you remind yourself, but I'm going to heaven. The best is yet to come. Amen? Here's number two. <clears throat> Become others-oriented. If you go through our growth track, you're going to hear us talk about when we will do everything short of sin to reach people for Christ. And we're not motivated for... Uh, it's not about us getting bigger. What, it, what motivates us is every single person that you ever meet, their soul is hanging in a balance between heaven and hell. And God has instructed us as his body to reach as many people possible for his kingdom. And that's what we want to be about. Even if it, it's inconvenient to us, we want to be about what's going to last for eternity. You know what? Everything around us is going to go away. But people are going to last forever. And that's what we want to be about. We want to be about people because people are going to spend eternity somewhere. And we want them to spend eternity with God. And we're going to do everything we we can do to reach people. Jude says this, be merciful to those who doubt, snatch others from the fire and save them. And the Bible begs us to do that. Revelation 22, 17, one of the last passages in the Bible says this, the spirit and the bride says, come. Now maybe you're here today and, and maybe you're, you're taking all this in and you say, man, I, I would love to be a part of this, man. but you, don't have, you have no idea what I've done. You don't understand the shame I'm under and what I've been involved in and what I'm currently uh, involved in. Man, if you really knew, I, I'm not quite sure you'd be accept, I'd be accepted here, uh, you know, if you really understood where I'm at. I want to say this, if that's you this morning, there's not a person here this morning that's better than you. We just got here a little ahead of you. You follow what I'm saying? So we welcome you here with any of your mess ups, any of your hang ups. We're all in the process of being healed and restored by Jesus Christ. And we want to encourage you to be a part of that. And it says this, and let him who hear say, come. Whoever is thirsty, whoever, that's everybody. Whoever is thirsty, let him come. And whoever wishes, let him take the free gift of water of life. And that's for every single one of us. And here's the last point. It's a short point, and that is go all in with God. Renew your relationship with God. Second Peter says this, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, a home of righteous, righteousness. Watch this. So, so it says then, so then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, what are we looking forward to? Heaven. We're looking forward to eternity. We're looking forward to being in a perfect environment with a God that loves us. Make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. And hear this. There is nothing that you can do to bring about those things. There's nothing that you can do to remove the spots. You can't get rid of the blame. You can't bring about that peace in your heart on your own that God wants you to, to, to experience. But why did Jesus come? He came 
to remove the barriers between us and God so that we could have a right relationship with God, so that he could remove all our sin, so that we can experience the, the peace of God that's beyond comprehension. And there may be somebody here today, and, and, and you, maybe you haven't really experienced that. I, and I want to just like really close with two prayers. I want to close with one prayer. If you've never really surrendered your life to God, and, and you really couldn't answer the question that, when you pass on from this life to the next, you don't know where you would go. Settle that issue this morning. We're not going to ask you to do anything goofy or anything like that, but I am going to ask you to pray a prayer between you and God right now. And then I want to pray, a, then all of us to, to join me in just praying a prayer that we would live our life in light of eternity. Let's just bow our heads and pray right now. And if you've never invited Jesus Christ into your life, I just want to encourage you, just pray this prayer. Lord, I admit that I'm not perfect, that I've sinned, that I've blown it, that I've made mistakes. God, I admit all those things. And God, I, uh, so many times I've just done things uh, to just for wrong reasons and wrong motives, and I ask you, God, right now to forgive me for all those wrong things. And God, I do want to do want to spend eternity with you. God, I, I want to have a right relationship with you. I want to experience that peace that I'm hearing about this morning. And God, I ask you that you would invade my heart, that you would just forgive me for all my sins. And Jesus, from this day forward, I choose to follow you. And I would, I would just encourage all of us to pray this prayer this morning. Father, forgive me for those times that I've been distracted by those things that, that's not going to last forever. Forgive me for those times that I've been a, a, a poor steward of my time and talent and resources. And God, I, I just pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just begin to, to convict me. I pray, Lord, I have a sensitive spirit that would hear the Holy Spirit convict me when I start to get distracted. God, help me to live my life in light of eternity. Father, break my heart over the things that break your heart in this world. And Father, I, I just pray, God, that you would just help me to be all that you've called me to be. Help me to be Jesus to my community, to my family, to my friends.